I'm Nana Fantolbeck for Buzz News. Freedom Under Law has expressed deep concern about the killing of well-known insolvency practitioner Clutter Murray and his son Thomas. And we have former Constitu Constitutional Court Justice Judge Johan Krichler in the studio with us, who sits on the board of Freedom Under Law uh, to discuss it. Um, hello, Judge Krichler, and welcome. Good afternoon, Zinda. Good afternoon to the viewers. Well, this appears to be a political assassination. Are you concerned that this is becoming more prevalent in South Africa, that it's silencing the corruption busters or whistleblowers? No, no, let's make it quite clear at this stage. And uh, a responsible lawyer cannot say it's a political assassination or not. It looks like it. It certainly does look like it. The kind of work that the, the Murrays were doing has political implications. But they were doing a lot of work. They were pursuing scoundrels other than political scoundrels. And it may well be that other people thought it better of it to get rid of them. Uh, the fact is it's an assassination in order to pervert the course of justice. And for that reason, it's a, a threat to the rule of law in itself, whether it's political or not. Political makes it worse. And there's been other cases like this. There's been other people who've been silenced. Oh, certainly. We've And we've had a, a very recently the shocking case of a young whistleblower whose evidence we knew, uh, certainly established subsequently, would have led to the conviction of certain people for certain crimes of corruption. Uh, but there have been plenty. There have been far too many. There have been policemen. There have been witnesses, there have been defense lawyers, there have been a magistrate, the, uh, quite apart from the habitual assassination of political opponents in KwaZulu-Natal. It's becoming more and more common, and it's a decided threat to the rule of law. But apart from the threat to rule of law, um, what is the impact on whistleblowers and law enforcement in South Africa if this happens? It's, it's, it is, of course, it is aimed not only to get rid of the particular witness or particular investigator or particular prosecutor, but it is aimed at the deterrent to others, to frighten off the others. And there is certainly good reason to think that young magistrates in exposed courts in rural areas are indeed frightened and rightly frightened. And uh, the whistleblowers notoriously are exposed and are frightened, and we do not have sufficient mechanisms to protect them. You talked about mechanisms. Are they protected under the Constitution? Are they protected under the Constitution? Uh, but they're also protected under specific legislation that was adopted uh, in, t in terms of the Constitution in order to protect them. The mechanism is not perfect. Not only is it theoretically legally not perfect, but administratively uh, it is not perfect. And uh, the, for instance, when or do you qualify as a whistleblower? only if and when it is established that the evidence you present, in fact, would lead to a prosecution of a corruption case. That's a very far down the line. And listen until that has been determined by the authorities, you as a whistleblower are standing naked and alone. And that is a problem that is experienced, to my knowledge, by whistleblowers. So how can we address that in, in law or um, in the Constitution? <laughs> address it, certainly. Cure it will take a long time. Address it by tightening up the legislation, making it easier, making the determination of the trigger mechanism for, for protection uh, at an earlier stage of the proceedings, and also, of course, purely administratively, to provide adequate resources for the authorities dealing with whistleblowers in order to deal with them competently, quickly, and effectively. 
Well, so South Africa is now sort of in common language starting to be called a mafia state. Do you agree with, uh, with that, calling South Africa a mafia state or descending into a mafia state? I, I, I'm sorry, I'm an old-fashioned lawyer. <laughs> I don't go for vivid terms, but I can see why people, uh, certainly in, in journalistic language, it fits, and in legal language at this stage, uh, I would rather say it. It's just stick to it. It looks like a political assassination uh, to prevent witnesses and or investigators pursuing the particular targets who have committed politically related crimes. That's what the Murray case looks like at the moment. And that in itself is a serious threat to all of us. If the law cannot protect those people, how can it protect? any of the rest of us. Well, if you don't like terms like that, can I ask you about lawfare, this growing reliance on courts to clarify and settling highly contentious political issues. Has that become part of the South African zeitgeist? That has become part of the South African scene, Linda, and it is it is deplorable. I do deplore that it happens. Why it happens is clear because of the political system that is defective in that the ruling party is immune to effective political control. There is no prospect or by, in the political arena, it is seen that there is no realistic prospect. If a, if a politician misbehaves in a democracy, the remedy is that that defaulting politician, it's fired at the next election. That doesn't happen in South Africa. Hasn't happened up to now. Uh, but if you're a member of the ruling party who must be heirs politically, you're pretty secure. We know that Parliament itself has failed, despite clearest indications, to deal with President Zuma at the time, to the great detriment of the country, to the ruin of the country. In fact, that the Parliament refused to look at the evidence until many years later a courageous public protector forced them to look at it and a courageous constitutional court backed the public protector. But it, 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 as we stand at the moment, and the only like, means of compelling government to do what the Constitution and the law obliges it to do is not at the ballot box. Unfortunately, it's in the courts, which has the effect of politicizing the judiciary and judicializing politics, neither of which is desirable. You talked about the courageous um, public protector, what's obviously the previous one, Tully Modern Seller. The current one is also a very, very courageous, unfortunately, on the wrong side of the law. <laughs> yeah. Well, were you out, um, talk about being worried the, about what's happening? Did you? Did, but do you see how she was treated? In, 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 you know, by Darlene Bofu. I mean, what did you think of taking a person of that stature and just reducing her to what what he was trying to do in that case? Uh, Linda, you're on to a topic now that I could could talk on with. It's considerable vehemence and even some eloquence for a long, long time. The, the the abuse of the privileged position of a legal practitioner, an advocate admitted officer of the court who has certain privileges, certain benefits, but is also subject to very, very clear moral, ethical rules. I have no hesitation in saying that in the cross-examination of the public protector, the former public protector, advocate Dali Mpofu breached the rules of professional ethics. He, he treated her in a manner which is un... I'm un, un, looking for a word which is strong enough without being defamatory. <laughs> <laughs> or swearing. <laughs> It certainly is impermissible. It is improper. 
it is not in the interest of the legal profession, it's not in the interests of society. Uh, unfortunately, the Legal Practice Council, the statutory body that was recently created in order to police the behavior of legal practitioners, has so far proved a feckless body in order to deal with people such as Mr. Porfu, who breached the rules of professional ethics. It, it should have dealt with him much more forcefully. It comes out, held uh, a, a mock trial in which they found him not guilty on the previous charge of misbehavior before the Zondo Commission uh, on, on spurious grounds. Uh, the problem is not the law. Yeah. The problem is the people who must who are to implement the law. The Legal Practice Council should have dealt with Mr. Mpofu. They have not done so. And do you think they're not going to in future? Would there be pressure on them to actually start applying? There is the a good deal of pressure on them. Uh, I believe that there is some pressure within the Legal Practice Council to deal with it. Let's hold thumbs. The track record is not good, uh, but it, it may take time. Eventually, uh, I believe they will deal with people such as Mr. Paul who use the privilege of advocacy in the courtroom for purposes other than those intended by the law. And one last thing that I also wanted to discuss with you, um, Julian Mandunsela, Advocate Tudi Manasella mentioned the fact that somebody like Mbofu, Advocate Mbofu, drags out court cases because he's being paid by the state. You know, how do you prevent that? This is yet another topic on which I could keep you busy for a very long time, very vehemently, and that put quite eloquently. The system, in principle, is perfectly straightforward. If you are a, a, an exerciser of state power, a government servant, judge, traffic cop, policeman, uh, civil servant, if you are charged with a crime arising out of the exercise of your official duties, a policeman who arrests somebody, a traffic cop who stops somebody, a civil servant who finds somebody uh, to be dishonest, uh, uh, a judge who, in giving a judgment, finds somebody to, uh, wrongly to, to have been guilty of a crime or in the exercise of his duties as a commissioner, uh, fails to look at evidence properly, of which we have an ex example in South Africa. If you are then charged with that crime arising out of the exercise of your official duties, you're entitled to state benefit to defend you within reason, within a reason as to the seniority and the, and the, the priciness of your legal representatives, and within reason in terms of time. If you are ultimately found guilty, i.e. that you had not been acting in terms of your official powers, but you had abused them, you had ostensibly used them for your own purposes, you've got to pay back the money that the state has spent on your legal practitioners. In our case, in a number of important cases, of, of which uh, the current public protector is the most recent vivid example, the state is paying for the de for the defense irrespective of whether it arose out of official duties or not. Uh, the the Schaubeck case, of course, with which you're familiar, is, is the best example, which was a, a, a case uh, arising out of something that was clearly not within the judge's terms of office. Uh, it could never have been. It was in the very nature of the charge that he was doing something 
that the judge should not be doing and cannot be doing, and, and yet uh, many, many millions have been spent in, in that defense. It, this then has the baleful effect that not only for the lawyers to make money, but in order to put off the evil hour of what we have come to call the Stalingrad defense, yeah. fighting from battery to battery, the, the block by block, uh, the Zuma case is the best example. Yeah. That has now been going on for umpteen years, and he still has not yet been put into one single day in a court of law where the trial against him is due to start. Uh, his co-operator in the, the alleged corruption uh, was convicted, heaven knows how many years ago, must be 20 years ago by now. So it's 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 a process that is misapplied and then, then abused. So so how do you address that? How do we stop that? Because it clearly Perfect. needs to be ended. Perfectly simple. There's nothing complicated about it. If somebody is charged with some crime arising not in the exercise of that person's duties, you get no backing for your defense. If it does arise out of the exercise of your duties, you know that if you are convicted at the end of the proceedings, you will have to pay back what you are asking the state to pay in the meantime. That is a pretty strong deterrent if you are pretty uncertain about your own innocence. I think that those two provisions in themselves will do a great deal. And thirdly, the the privilege, the benefit of being able to call on the state to pay for your lawyers does not mean that you can import the most expensive silk from the London bar to defend you in South Africa. That's unreasonable. You can't do that. It can only be your reasonable legal expenses. And what is legal, uh, what is reasonable will have to be determined in each particular case on its merits. What's the ch charge? What is the seniority of the person being charged? Uh, what are the implications of a conviction? So, but who must make that decision? Is that the Parliament? State, the, state, no, no, the, the state attorney who is responsible for authorizing these payments must make an honest, straightforward decision which is conveyed to the subject person at the time in clear terms. It's, it's not tricky. If I may say so, no, I won't. <laughs> you may. <laughs> it didn't work. It is one of, the, one of the things that worked in the evil days of apartheid. I know I was an advocate. I appeared for police, but it would be charged with crime. Static offences. Uh, yes, if the if the policeman was convicted, he had to pay my fees. In the meantime, the state attorney paid. Uh, Judge John Grechler, that was just so fascinating. Thank you so much. I mean, we, there's a lot we can talk about. I think we need to keep in touch. Uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you to you as well.